Okay, greetings and a warm welcome to everybody who has uh, joined this Understanding Risk Asia community session. Uh, my name is Simon Hagemann. Uh, I'm a um, uh, financial sector specialist in the World Bank's Crisis and Disaster Risk Finance Team, a global team within the finance competitiveness and innovation global practice. Um, I'm working globally and I'm part of the P. Crafty Multi Donor Trust Fund team. So thank you everybody who has joined this session uh, to support um, this exchange of, of ideas, learning across the region uh, on developments and opportunities to further increase risk information in the Pacific. Um, as part of uh, um, a um, TA under PICRAFI, um, the World Bank is working with the SBC, so the Pacific community, and we're updating the so-called Pacific Risk Information System, PACRIS, the largest collection of georeference data in the Pacific, uh, basically a regional uh, hazard and exposure database with data for 14 countries. Uh, the theme of today's webinar is advancing risk information decision making in the Pacific uh, challenges and opportunities. So what, what we would like to do is to discuss the importance of risk databases, not just ACRIS, but in general. And we would like to encourage a discussion around risk data as a public good, explore work on risk modeling, uh, what's being done at the global uh, and the regional scale before zooming in into the national level. And then we would like to close the uh, discussion with opportunities uh, to further increase risk information in the Pacific. Um, the community session will discuss the benefits of those tools like PACRIS, uh, challenges associated with databases and their effective use for, for policymakers. And we would like to highlight, highlight opportunities for increasing risk data and information for the region. So we're very happy to have a big panel of very esteemed individuals. Uh, they will share their knowledge experience with us in this session. Uh, we will introduce each panelist individually before they take the stage. Uh, maybe just a word on how we run the session. So the session is 90 minutes long and it will be uh, obviously virtually facilitated by, by my SPC colleague, Aline Turara and myself. And what we would like to do is we would like to make this webinar as interactive as possible and to encourage participants uh, who are watching and listening in to use the chat function to make comments or post questions also while people are speaking. So, um, so what we try to do is we have 90 minutes, obviously quite short for the number of panelists we have. Uh, we will ask the panelists uh, to answer the questions in less than five minutes. And if you have any question um, as the audience, the panelists during the interventions, uh, we would give uh, the panelists actually the opportunity to answer them right away. So we would like uh, um, to, to invite panelists to actually use and look at the chat function. Uh, and pending time, you know, some questions, comments will be compiled by, by, by the moderators and, and Akosita um, from the regional team. And we will try to then hopefully address as many comments as we can uh, in the final Q&A session. And before we move to the panelists today, um, warm welcome to my fellow co-moderator, -moder Eileen Turara from the Pacific community. And she will provide a little bit of background about PACRIS, so the Pacific Risk Information System, uh, and why the World Bank has engaged in this SBC to update the system. Uh, thanks a lot, and over to you, Eileen. Thank you, um, Simon, and hi to everyone um, who has joined this webinar today. Um, great to be part of this um, opportunity. And also thank you to our panelists who have agreed to be on the panel today. Um, just to start off with, my name is Eileen, um, and I am the uh, Pacific um, Picrafi project manager here at SBC, implementing the support um, that is supported by um, the World Bank. So as we all know, um, in the Pacific, um, the Pacific is highly vulnerable to the adverse impacts of climate change related and geological hazards. These obviously pose very significant, significant threats to important economic sectors, such as infrastructure, agriculture, and personal property. So risk-informed decision-making in the region is um, limited due to the current sparsity of risk data. Um, obviously, there have been progress and some, some um, enhancements, but I guess there is a, lo a lot more to be done. 
common hazards that Pacific Island countries um, face and are affected by are cyclones and earthquakes, droughts, volcanic eruptions, and flooding. That's obviously not related to cyclone activity as well. So at the regional level, the framework for resilient development in the Pacific for the FRDP, that's and the establishment of the Pacific Resilience Partnership as the FRDP's implementation mechanism has been established to coordinate resilience building to climate change and disasters, including pandemics. The FRDP places a strong emphasis on managing disaster and climate change risks, and risk data is obviously needed to support and inform solutions to a range of resilient challenges that are outlined in the FRDP. The Pacific Catastrophe Risk Assessment and Financing Initiative that Simon has mentioned earlier was established in 2009 to develop disaster risk assessment tools and practical technical and financial applications to reduce and mitigate the impacts of natural hazards in the region. Um, a deliverable from this phase was the development of the Pacific Risk Information System, or PACRIS, and this laid PACRIS laid the technical foundation for the current TECRAFI program, which is currently being implemented. And uh, PACRIS is an open source platform. It's built upon a geonode infrastructure. It is an open repository for the region to provide risk-related geospatial data hazards, data sets for enabling risk information. These data sets range from satellite imagery to country-specific information on assets, population, hazards, and risk. So the data was acquired through primary and secondary sources. And from these um, data sets, risk profiles were developed for 14 Pacific Island countries. At that time, more than 500 buildings were digitized from very high resolution satellite images. And this represented 15% of the total number of Pacific Island countries at that time. About 80,000 buildings and major infrastructures were also physically inspected. In addition, about 3 million buildings and other assets, mostly in rural areas, were inferred from satellite imagery. So pending the current status, there is an opportunity to verify these assets on the ground in country in this phase. When it comes to hazard data, PACRIS includes a comprehensive regional historical hazard catalog of earthquake and tropical cyclone events. It also includes historical loss space for major disasters. It also contains risk maps showing geographic distribution of potential losses for each Pacific Island country, as well as other visualization products. And um, this is all accessible from um, the PACRIS website. So how has the data been used um, to date? Um, just a bit about this, uh, what we found through an online survey to countries is that um, most of the data has obviously been used by the technical people, the GIS folks in countries um, who are well versed with um, going about how to use um, GIS information. Uh, the data has also been utilized by other technical partners in the disaster risk reduction and climate change space within the region and um, also by academia who have used it in their research. Um, but obviously there still remains um, room to uh, use the data in that decision-making process. So essentially over time, there is now a need to update the data um, that exists in the PACRIS system. The World Bank is currently providing support for the update of this data. Um, of this regional repository of hazard and exposure data through the engagement of the Pacific community or SPC to work with countries in the region to achieve this. And in the process, we aim to build the capacity of the Pacific Island countries to update and maintain their own national risk databases, as well as build capabilities in countries for risk-informed planning and evidence-based policies. So looking at how we can work with the countries um, to be able to better use this um, data as a public good in their decision-making processes. So maybe if, if I just talk about 
the update of the data and what exactly is being updated. So, so far, we brought the countries together and we agreed on attributes that would be used in the data collection survey. And that has been used to develop a data collection survey template that has also been sent to the countries for comment. As well as that, um, our team has also updated the journal platform upon which PACRIS sits to the latest version, and that has also been deployed. We are also developing and have started also um, on the training package that is meant to go to the countries at the end of the project. And so far we have developed a field handbook that supports the um, template, the data collection template. And we're also in the process of developing and soon to finish a journaled manual update as well as the survey manual um, that will support um, the survey process. There is also a risk assessment guideline that is, that is um, to be developed next year. And from that, we hope to run um, regional risk assessment um, training for countries. As part of the communication and learning of this um, support, we would also, we are also working with a risk an analysis consulting company to develop case studies in risk assessment. So case studies at the national level, the urban level and the community level. And for these to be turned into knowledge products that will be shared with the countries and something to be used um, going forward as part of their um, risk assessment in countries. So I think with that, um, I will hand back to Simon for the next. Thank you, Simon. Thanks very much, Aline. Um, very much appreciated. Thanks uh, again and, and uh, welcome to all of the speakers. Um, we will start directly with, uh, with our first speaker, who is Rashmin Gunasekera. Uh, Rashmin, you're a Senior Disaster Risk Management Specialist at the World Bank. And uh, Rashmin is leading the Global Program for Disaster Risk Analytics at GFDR, so the Global Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery. Uh, he is, he's focusing, amongst many other things, on disaster risk analytics and disaster risk financing. Uh, Rushman was also the task team leader of uh, the World Bank's multi-donor trust fund for CRIF, so the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk and Insurance Facility. Um, and he has so lots of experience uh, in various regions, including the, the Caribbean. So Rushman, the, the World Bank has been supporting the development of PACRIS, and we're currently working on its update. Uh, and you were, as I just said, the task team leader of, of the CRIF project. So looking at developments in disaster and climate risk at the global and regional levels and drawing from your extensive experience in different regions, um, what did you find were the key lessons learned in working with risk data in efforts to make risk information more useful as a public good? And what things worked, uh, for example, in the Caribbean that could be translated into the Pacific context? Rashmin, over to you. Thank you, Simon, and thank you also, Eileen, for the great introduction and, and setting up the scene. You know? So it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm really happy to share some of my thoughts, specifically on the two different aspects that you were referring to, Simon. One, in terms of how, for example, PACRIS could actually be further strengthened, right? And there are lots of different aspects. Um, uh, Aline actually talked about more of the, what, what PACRIS is actually doing, but I can actually also talk more, perhaps more in terms of the applications of it, right? Because I see so many different applications that actually goes beyond just disaster risk quantification or development of a financial product. One of the key things that we can actually look into is thinking beyond development of an inventory of public assets, which is kind of the primary goal of it. But you could also then look into lots of different facets associated with it. For example, the underlying analytics that this would actually be able to provide from the practice portfolio. One key thing could also be adaptive social protection or shock responsive social protection, right? Where you could actually see how um, 
uh, we could actually look at the vulnerability, not only from the structural perspective, but also from a household perspective as well, by merging the different exposure data sets that Eileen actually uh, alluded to. You could, of course, look into disaster risk quantification, but when you have this wealth of data, you could also better integrate it to public finance management purposes of, of, of governments as well. Uh, as we all know, normally governments would look at their inventories in terms of their contents, you know, but now we are actually going to a different mindset and that's what the Caribbean has also taught us is how to better integrate the, the building stock itself in, in, in the risk assessment and, and in the inventory. Another key thing that's actually equally important is looking at, for example, um, dynamic exposure. I think Elin also uh, alluded to this. For example, if you have actually a changing climate, the risk is also changing, right? And the, the database that we're actually looking into developing needs to also be, be adaptable as well. And, and that's a key consideration. That also looks then into disaster risk reduction. For example, building codes, right? If you want to look at the vulnerability of the building stock, and if you want to look at the hazard information that would inform the building codes, what PACRIS is actually doing gives a wealth of information to, to support that. Um, and then we can also talk in terms of the conditions of the assets themselves. It's not just the, okay, here's an asset, but as I said, that, that time variability. Some key lessons learned associated with it looks into, for example, a sector-based approach. We are seeing much more of um, interest, not only at the national level, but sector-based approaches to disaster risk financing as well. So that's a key part to look into. But some of the challenges might be, I think Eileen also alluded to, who owns the data? Who's actually responsible for sharing that particular data? What are the different um, uh, requirements from the different countries, et cetera, as well? And uh, this actually is important because you need to have a fallback option. Uh, we'll finally um, wrap up by saying, uh, anecdote from, from the Caribbean. Uh, there was a huge database that was actually developed, uh, but it was placed in the basement of, of, the, uh, of, of the ministry. And guess what? When uh, um, a hurricane event actually occurred, the basement got flooded. Luckily, someone had the foresight to record that or, or get that database on a USB stick. Otherwise, the whole thing was actually lost. So we need to be managing our own risk as well. No? So on that note, I will let you stop. Thanks. Thank you for that intervention, Rashmin. Um, that was a really good insight into um, the applications more so of um, Packers, as opposed to it just being an inventory of um, assets. So now we will move to the next speaker. If I can introduce um, panelist number two is um, Dr. Habiba Gite. Dr. Habiba is an international expert in climate resilient development, having been coordinating the lead author in the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from 1992 to 2000. Um, Dr. Habiba, uh, joined the World Bank in 2007 and was based in Washington, D.C. till she moved to the Suba office in 2017. Her focus is an integrating climate resilience and disaster risk management in development strategies, policies, programs, and projects. She also conducted analytical work to support the SIDS, which is reflected in reports such as the Building Resilience Report. In the Pacific, she has worked in partnership with central and sectoral agencies to design and implement climate and disaster relief resilient investments at the community level and resilient public buildings. This work has included technical and analytical support for risk-based spatial planning, consideration of appropriate financing instruments and policies, coordination and strengthening policies in multiple sectors, 
to develop effective climate and disaster resilient development. So prior to joining the World Bank, Dr. Habiba was also at the Australian National University. So if I can um, turn to you, um, Habiba, as part of your work at the World Bank, you have worked on climate change projects in most of the countries in the Pacific. How have countries accessed the risk-based data developed under PACRIS and PICRAFI, and how has it been used in decision-making, if there are any examples on that? And what are some of the challenges they may have faced, you think that they have faced, and how did they overcome this? Thank you, and over to you. Thank you very much, Eileen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm, thank you for the introduction, but also I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Um, it's an important issue in terms of a global public good and the data availability, especially for small island nations in the Pacific. So let me sort of give you two examples. Um, where the PACRIS information was really useful. And thank you for giving that overview, Eileen, of PACRIS, because I don't have to do that in the five minutes that I have. Um, so for Solomon Islands, uh, we were supporting a project that was participatory, so involved communities, but also involved uh, small infrastructure. So whether we were building bridges between small islands or whether we were uh, doing evacuation centers and so on. So for us, really having that asset information that you mentioned and georeference asset information was really important because it was collected in uh, almost a decade before the project went ahead. We could also see the changes in some of the coastal areas and so on. So that was useful in being able to use that information directly. Now, there were some challenges in terms of access to the data, but also in terms of just the bandwidth. And I'll come back to that in a minute as part of the second question that you asked. Um, in Samoa, we, uh, the government, wanted to do a risk-based planning for both of the major islands. So they really wanted to take the geo risk, but also the climate related risks into account and do a risk-based planning for the whole of the country. Um, for that, we were able to help the government acquire LIDAR data and also high resolution aerial photography. We did look at what information was available in PACRIS and it really wasn't granular enough for them to be able to use it. Again, it was a participatory process and we wanted to make sure that the communities were involved. So what they ended up doing was actually doing some of the work that PACRIS had in terms of doing georeferencing of assets really finding out using the LIDAR data to do the gradients and do three digital 3D elevation models. And they had experts from social development and from biodiversity expertise, forests and so on. So it really was a well integrated uh, effort, but could not really draw on the APRIS data. Um, the PICRAFI data for us is really useful. And Rashman highlighted some of it in terms of the post-disaster needs assessment. For us, it also is a way of uh, providing an overview within our project documents on what the risks are, especially from the high um, uh, event, sort of uh, low frequency, but high impact events like category five cyclones, but also tsunami. And for us, that really forms an important narrative of how climate and disaster risks are part of, have to be part of the development agenda. Um, it does inform the risk layering approach the countries have to take, and it also has to inform um, their disaster risk financing strategy or policy that's being developed in Tonga, Samoa, and other countries. So the PICRAFI information is good for uh, the um, post-disaster assessment, but also good for the broader development decisions. Um, so what are the challenges? Uh, so the challenges, is, as I said before, is really the access to the information. It is heavy in terms of the data availability, um, and it, which means internet connectivity. Until recently, I'd say even five years ago, it was a massive challenge for countries to be able to get that information downloaded so they could even look at the map, let alone play with the information. 
So we worked with SPC to actually get some CDs, data on the CDs. And I know it's really hard to think about CDs these days, uh, but really get that information over to the countries and especially in Solomons. And they were able to use it and then the next challenge was to be able to manipulate it. So when they collected the information, um, could they update that database? And it, because it was a proprietary data software and it required licensing, it was a bit difficult, but we were able to work through and do it our, uh, and update it and also manipulate the data to get the information to the decision makers and to inform the um, location of the investments as well that I mentioned earlier. For us, the sustainability of having such a database becomes an issue. So it really can be a public source software so the government can maintain it instead of having a licensing fee, which is expensive for countries to maintain if they do not have a project in that space. So as a practitioner, I, I, can, I understood, uh, I mean, that once you become familiar with the data, it's easy to use, but as a practitioner who needs to go uh, some maybe once a year, a couple of times a year. It's not an intuitive database that you can access at the moment, at least for me. And maybe I'm not that well versed with databases, but I use a lot around the world. So I'm hoping I'm not as naive. Um, so for us, really having a platform that can be intuitive, can use the data fairly quickly, would be really useful. I use the World Development Data and the Climate Change Knowledge Portal, which are both accessible through the World Bank websites very easily. It takes a little bit of time to learn, but once you learn it, it's fairly intuitive. So really thinking about how you can make the data accessible as you develop PACRIS uh, would be really welcome. I'll stop there. Thank you very much again uh, for uh, bringing these panelists together. Thank you so much, Habiba, and thank you so much to, for, for talking about concrete examples uh, as well as sharing very, very concrete challenges might be you know license licensing updating updating them databases not being intuitive and also very this is all very very interesting and very hands-on um so thank you very much our next speaker is uh, carlos lee morrissey uh, he is program advisor uh, for resilience development finance at the pacific islands forum secretariat and as part of his role he coordinates the so-called regional technical working group on disaster risk financing and prior to this, Lee held the position of Secretary of Finance for the government of Tuvalu, and he was the CEO for the Tuvalu Trust Fund. So given his vast experience in financial management, he uh, provided guidance in the establishment of the Tuvalu Survival Fund and Disaster Response and Recovery Fund. So Carlos, over to you. What, what entry points or possible entry points have been used or could be used uh, to integrate risk data as part of risk reduction or resilience development processes in the region. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Simon, for the introduction. And also I'd like to thank the uh, World Bank and your organization for including PIFS and myself in uh, this very important uh, dialogue and discussion. Um, I think what I'm gonna say is really built on what uh, Aileen started off in the, in the introduction, and also uh, Rashman uh, touched on uh, a bit on some of the stuff I wanted to cover. But let me just start by saying that the primary data needs to be complemented by secondary level data. Um, they can be overlaid on each other. And when I talk about overlaying, it also translates across to the implementation in terms of different layers. Obviously, sitting from a, uh, a regional perspective, we obviously have the regional layer, we have the, the national, and also is, in some stages, the uh, in some instances, uh, subnational. So what is primary data to one user may be secondary data to another, depending on the, what the need is. Um, and for example, if you're collecting, uh, Rashman uh, referred to this or alluded to it, if you're collecting climate and uh, environmental data for specific location, you may also be interested in social data, uh, like coastal population distributions, economic and financial data, uh, like sources of income and enablers for economic activity in their particular location. And this is really important when it comes to the local community implementation level. Um, where the data collection needs to be uh, verified and also becomes accepted uh, in terms of uh, uh, how they translate into uh, strategies and uh, uh, policies for specific uh, locations. Uh, the level of data sets obviously therefore need to be accessible and to uh, be presented in a way that makes sense to uh, policymakers at all levels. Before you start talking about entry points, the data needs to make sense and needs to be transferable into uh, uh, policies. Now, pulling back into a regional lens, um, 
the dynamics of climate change impacts are constantly being updated and revised. So the data collection database also needs to remain current and relevant. Um, and to formulate regional policies, perhaps it's a, a broader summative data analytics is more appropriate rather than get into the details, um, as in the case in the, in the Pacific of the FRDP, which is the framework for resilience development in the Pacific. Um, but together with the raw data, we need uh, regional data governance in place, including data uh, infrastructure, uh, data ownership, and data continuity. Um, it's, what, what we're finding challenging sometimes, and uh, I think Habib also alluded to some of this, is that sometimes you, you can access data and then uh, people change at the national level and trying to access the, the data seems to shift with the people shifting. Uh, and it's really uh, trying to, to get verification and accuracy of data becomes uh, an issue. Um, obviously, technology can uh, uh, greatly help uh, in that uh, aspect. At the national level, uh, we need to integrate country level data uh, um, also to be accessible to development partners. When development partners come to the country um, and develop uh, programs and, and, and policies, uh, and before they you know, uh, in the Pacific context, there's a lot of uh, heavy reliance on development partners to assist, especially in the space of disaster risk uh, financing. So there needs to be a, a sharing across all levels of decision making, not just the, and I talk about data ownership and just the tendency in some aspects. And this is where PEC risk comes in really is important in terms of uh, uh, bringing um, uh, country level data into one space that can be accessible. Uh, if, if there was not so, uh, it would be really, really hard to have uh, uh, regional wide programs um, that are effective. Another example of, uh, I refer to the community level in uh, using social data. At the community local level, we need access to subnational data sets uh, that are used for localized adaptation strategies and programs. Um, and there are obvious different layers in risk reduction and disaster preparedness policies, uh, starting from my standpoint as a regional organization. Uh, I refer to the FRDP. And then we also have to, to operationalize um, the FRDP in the, in the lens of the national level. Uh, we we come up against this quite quite often when we talk to uh, to our national counterparts, where they need to have ownership, um, and ownership of the policies really is about translating that to to make them realize that the national uh, uh, policies need to be based on their data sets. Um, and following through from the FRAP, noting that it's alignment to the global uh, uh, Sendai framework, uh, we need to move to the national levels with an assessment of disaster risk using national and subnational data sets to help. Um, and the tra that transition also becomes an, another uh, element where you can dis discuss data, not just in the sense, sense of uh, data sets in their raw sense, but also in how they uh, translate into uh, policy formulations. Uh, community level interventions, I mentioned earlier the importance of community involvement in data collection um, and validation. This has an important role in ensuring data acceptance, data awareness, and this will ensure that they, uh, through data ownership, that there's also local acceptance of policies that are formulated or based on this particular data. Uh, we've come across situations where uh, there might be pushback in terms of uh, policies if you start quoting um, data information and, and, and uh, uh, climatic uh, uh, information. Sometimes you get pushback. So to, to get ownership in the local community of data and awareness of uh, where the information comes from, uh, if, if they're involved in data collection in the observations, you'll find that there's actually better uh, acceptance of uh, 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 policies and strategies. And a good example of how this has worked in the Pacific, uh, there was the recent launch of uh, the micro uh, parametric insurance uh, policies in Fiji uh, program through the uh, PICA project, where the entry point is through local cooperatives and community level based organizations like the Sugarcane Farmer Society, uh, the farmer market vendors. This become important uh, um, uh, entry points in where, where Acceptance of policy is really based on the acceptance and awareness of the data that came from them originally anyway. Uh, so there's a dynamic, that, uh, a circular dynamic in terms of the data collection and uh, reverting with uh, uh, disaster risk relate, uh, related policies and uh, uh, programs. Uh, finally, in the, in the question that was posed to me, there was a mention of the disaster risk financing uh, technical working group. This was recently endorsed by the Forum Economic Ministers through their meeting in July uh, this year. And, and this, this, this group, this technical work group, is, is formed under the governance of the Pacific Resilience uh, Program uh, Partnership. And it's made up of uh, obviously national representatives, uh, regional organizations, development partners, 
and also some NGOs and CSOs uh, representatives who are working in the in the disaster risk uh, uh, space. And this is an important element in terms of bringing together uh, coordination and, and collaboration. One of one of the issues we talk about is integration, um, and bringing this this partnership together through the technical working group allows the integration of uh, different viewpoints that feed into. Uh, how to interpret data into how data can be translated into uh, uh, policies. Uh, in particular, around disaster risk financing, um, this is also important. Uh, I think uh, Reshman also mentioned the importance of uh, not just the climatic data, but also financial data. And, and bringing this in combination uh, allows for better uh, effectiveness of policies. Uh, I'll stop there for now and I'll we'll welcome any uh, questions. Thank you um, for that, Carlos Lee. I think one of the things that resonates with everyone is data ownership, and that's what you touched on um, much. And I think when data ownership takes place and the use of the, you know, the data, it creates that um, demand that um, obviously relates and links to the sustainability of the, the, da the data itself. Thank you again. Um, so now we'll move to the next uh, panelist. Uh, Hervé Damlinian, he has um, been privileged to work on one of the interfaces between science and decision makers as he heads the ocean prediction and monitoring team at the Pacific community here at SBC. Um, obviously, SBC is an international development organization owned and governed by its 26 Pacific Island countries and territories, and it is the principal scientific and technical organization for the Pacific region. Pervo joined the SBC as the former SOPAC in 2005 as a numerical modeler. And he obviously fell in love with the Pacific Island countries, its people, and especially his wife and its cultural wealth. And he first discovered this while undertaking fieldwork through the region. Being confronted with the impact of natural disasters through the early stage of his career while conducting post-disaster events profoundly shaped his professional development and boosted his motivation to develop scientific tools and knowledge products to strengthen the resilience of coastal communities around the region. Over the last decade, Herve and his team have been working towards supporting risk-informed decision-making in the Pacific region, either through the delivery of probabilistic inundation hazard and risk assessment, or more recently, through the development of regionally tailored and innovative inundation forecast systems. So welcome, Herve, and thank you again for being on the panel. You have quite extensive experience in the region, um, in this space. What are some of the changes or the real strides that have been made in the region since those early um, PACRIS days and with regards to enhancing the availability of risk data for risk information? And if there is time, what do you see from a regional perspective, what some of the immediate opportunities are to explore further um, and to enhance and increase risk data and information in the region. Thank you, Jose, and over to you. Thank you, Eileen, and, and greetings to, to all. Um, so in your, in your first question, uh, it, it's quite hard to pick because there has been quite a lot of um, uh, progress we've made in terms of understanding risk in the region over the last decade. Uh, but if I have to pick um, a couple, I would say um, one that I would like to, to highlight is the, is the way we've managed to improve um, the hazard information that is being delivered and produced in the region. And, and for this, there are really two drivers that would be possible. The first one and the main problem, really, it's how countries, how many countries of the Pacific have started to invest in high resolution. Uh, high quality baseline data, so bathymetry topography, which really uh, has changed the way we 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 working around uh, around risk really, and, and strengthened the whole workflow of uh, of our risk informed decision making in, in the region. Um, so so here we now have in few places, obviously we we will need more, but in few places we now have adequate data to really convert global climate and extreme weather event into into local impact and really being able to now minimize the, the uncertainty in the hazard information we're producing um, and in turn um, uh, you know having a having propitious 
information to to convert all this data into into actionable information to integrate to be part of the risk informed decision making process. Uh, we we even have two countries in the Pacific, uh, Tuvalu and Samoa, who have invested in national scale high resolution uh, lidar data, uh, which means that for these two countries we really have a wealth of opportunities here to to really strengthen risk information across all sectors. Uh, so, which is extremely exciting. And we actually capitalize, capitalize I have a, a bit of a rain. <laughs> um, so it's great because, sorry, I have to move. Okay, sorry about that. I hope you can still hear me. Um, so, well, I, I was just talking about um, about the, the baseline data, which has greatly improved in few places and has allowed us to, to create much better uh, uh, risk information and actionable information, reducing the uncertainty in our in the data we're producing and the product we're producing. Um, the, and maybe the, the second drive, maybe second, allowing us to produce better as a data is, all, is the methodology we now are using across the Pacific. Across the Pacific now, uh, around we um, developing hazard assessment product through uh, the development of hybrid modeling, combining stochastic, empirical, dynamic modeling, and machine learning, which allows us to, to really investigate a full ensemble of extreme event and future scenarios, and providing really robust uh, and sound hazard information. Uh, and, and those particular techniques are not just used to increase our risk knowledge, but it's also uh, the same technique and same product are also used to uh, to strengthen uh, the full all the pillars around the early warning system, such as uh, improving our forecast information and forecast system. And even now, uh, forecast system uh, in the Pacific that are forecast in the Pacific as a timely and accurate uh, hazard information. Uh, seven days in advance, uh, and those systems are tailored to the to the capacity and resources and resources available at the national med services. So, so those are very promising. And the last one I'd like to to mention, not a but around vulnerability. As we know, vulnerability uh, is one of a major in the region around the you know around the risk framework. Um, so really, it's about how do we convert hazard into into impact and and why we have this knowledge gap is really about the lack of the sparsity of adequate impact and what um, uh, Eileen you you touched on during your introduction is is one of the solutions we're looking into to address uh, the feeling of this gap which is having a country led process to uh, find or to come up with regional standards for our regional risk data. So here we're talking about exposure and impact data. Why do I think this is extremely promising? It's because let's say uh, next year there will be a disaster that strike in one particular country and impact data will be collected uh, with, with the standard uh, methodology that has been uh, developed. Uh, so obviously the impact data that's collected in that particular country will support the increased risk knowledge and a better understanding of the vulnerability of that particular community or that country. But also by sharing this information across the region, other countries can capitalize on this information, uh, especially countries that have similar risk and exposure profile can utilize, uh, you know, capitalize on this information to also increase their, their own risk knowledge. So here it's really a methodology or, or, or a solution that is based on or capitalized on our regional strengths, which is regionalism and regional cooperation, to boost the feeling of our um, of our knowledge. Uh, so, to mention. Uh, maybe if I have a little bit more time, I can uh, I can open opportunities and please let me please get some time. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, just, just uh, maybe one to two minutes, and uh, um, maybe I, I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, perfect. Thank you very much for your flexibility. Uh, I'll, I will blame the rain for it. Uh, so, a uh, couple of minutes. I will just mention some opportunities we have. Uh, we've we've had some successful uh, uh, projects that have, that were focusing on strengthening technical capacity in country 
to produce some risk assessment, uh, uh, or, uh, for example, product, as called from the partner project with our colleague in NIWA and GNS. Um, so, that, so up to now, we've been really looking now with uh, having a bottom-up a bottom-up bottom approach. Sorry to to um, to, to strengthening uh, risk informed decision making. Uh, while it's still necessary, and we need to, to keep what on that, uh, there is the opportunity maybe to also do a top-down approach and really um, looking not just uh, strengthening the, the technical capacity to produce this risk inf information, but also, also strengthening the whole institutional capacity to make, to make risk informed decisions. Better understanding for each country the specific uh, decision making process and also maybe better mapping the need and requirement of decision makers uh, so that we can tailor the technical capacity to, to be fit for purpose for the decision makers. Uh, maybe I already did my two minutes, so I will probably stop here and if they have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Avi, for, for adding a little bit, you know, some opportunities on, on how you strengthen the in-country technical capacity. I think we will have probably at the end of the session a little bit more time to talk about this as well. Uh, we will, uh, in the last step, we will move to uh, perspectives from countries. But before we do that, we, we have the honor of uh, introducing uh, Peak Week CEO, uh, Aulotu Palu. Um, so Aulotu is the CEO of Pacific Catastrophe Risk Insurance Company, Peak Week. And he has over 25 years of experience in economic management, finance, and development sectors. Um, as reflected in his various roles in the region and uh, internationally, actually. Prior to PICRIC, uh, Lotu was the GIZ Climate Finance and Public Finance Management Advisor uh, at the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, uh, and he provided strategic advice on the nexus between public financial management and climate change finance for Pacific Islands. He was also the former Chief Secretary and Secretary to, to Cabinet of the Government of Tonga, Acting Chief Executive Officer and Head of Aid Management for the Tonga Ministry of Finance and National Planning in Noku Alofa. Um, Lotu is committed to enhancing accessible and affordable climate and disaster related financial solutions for Pacific Island countries. So, Lotu, thanks very much for, for attending this event. And uh, obviously, PICRIC is a big user of the PACRIS data. Uh, we would very much appreciate if, if you could explain a little bit how PICRIC has been using PACRIS for product development and uh, maybe in a second uh, um, um, thought, maybe you could, you could elaborate a little bit on the challenges uh, that PICRIC has faced in using the data in PACRIS um, and maybe some recommendations on how to improve this going forward if this has not already been addressed. So the floor is yours, Roger. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And um, I hope uh, everyone can uh, hear me loud and clear. I will turn off the, my camera because of the connectivity issue here in the forum sector is not good in the, on the other side of the of the campus. But let me let me start by by thanking uh, Simon and Eileen for the invitation extended to, to us. Uh, you know, for us, this is a great work by Biography of the SPC arrangement uh, right now given the fact that we all need to have uh, an update property exposure information uh, across the region. Um, mostly, I mean, obviously, because, uh, you know, it's helped us uh, with our decision-making process going forward. And also to highlight also those key activities that um, Aileen uh, has outlined it during her remarks. To answer the questions, I'm probably going to try to wrap it in a more in a two in two ways, one from uh, from our perspective, and also to to really come up with what are the current challenges that we are facing using the data. Simon, as I understood uh, right now, uh, you know, since taking over this position uh, last year, that the company has not really been a user of the PICRIS data. We we've been using the outputs of the AI model to determine uh, the parameters of of policies, and while this data is held in the PICRIS. We haven't needed to access it via PICRIS. We were just using directly with the air model uh, organizations in terms of our development of our policy and also the model that we've been currently using right now. And having said that, 
uh, just for the benefit of uh, the audience. We are currently reviewing what is PICRIS in order to determine the approach for updating the cyclone product by redefining its modeling and analytic strategy with respect to both its current product offering and future product development in the Pacific Island countries. Uh, as you all know, this is an effort to ensure it remains fit for purpose, and this work has formed the basis of the company's strategy for future modeling and product development work for, for the countries in the region. I can say that uh, the company is aware that there is a requirement to update uh, the tropical cyclone model uh, that is used as the basis of the cyclone insurance policy. Improving Minitator helps uh, with our effort to structure the product and model according to the need of the countries. So that's an ongoing work that we are doing now. But coming down to the, the data that BigQuiz has been stored or collected from the region, uh, in as much as it was used in the development of uh, the Cyclone and FQA model by AIR, it was critical in developing the tools for us and in terms of AIR modeling, uh, uh, catastrophic model that the company has used to date develop insurance product. I fully understand that without uh, granular data covering both the physical characteristics as well as property exposure across the islands, those tools and models uh, and the resulting country risk profiles that we have created would not have been a ro as robust as they were now have stood the test of time as well as they did. But the company, uh, however, aware that to be able to continue to make confident or effective decisions on the back of these models and maintain the confidence of our international reinsurance partners, updates of these models are required, both due to the changing exposure at risk across the Pacific Island countries, but also in response to impact of climate change on hazards faced by the region. Just on, on the challenges uh, side and also the opportunities of, you know, having this uh, work done by uh, through the Big Coffee project within uh, SPC, I think the, the issue that we have to note, the current, and I think Habib had spoke about this early on and some of the prior speakers, they talk about the connectivity capability of the countries. You know, really, we talk about data, uh, but at the same time, we need to have to make sure that the countries have the connectivity capability uh, that should be robust and have the right infrastructure in place so that they can be able to you know provide uh, the center with the data with the required data for better analyst analytical work and also to make sure that the update data is provided timely and that also leads to accessibility and availability of data you know like if they have this capability in terms of connectivity improvement, that will allow them to also access and the availability of data for them. It's uh, it's also important. This is not just a demand side; it's both demand and supply side responsibility in you know correcting the data, using the data, and make sure the data is available to all countries. But if you look back to 30 years and uh, 20 years or 10 years ago. Things have changed. The landscape of, uh, you know, disaster service finance has been changed everywhere now. So the ongoing updating of the data is definitely required now. And it's it's a public good. We should treat this as a public good. And it's clearly is a, it's a good thing. But we have to, but I, I want to say two points here. One, we have to understand that risk is highly dynamic. And ensuring this risk data created is kept current is key to effective use and our ability as user to make robust and confident decisions from. With the potential impact of climate change across the regions, out of data, out of date data and information on risk would do more harm than, than good. That's that's how I, I, I observe the current work now. And if you, uh, I mean, it's good to us to collaborate and see if we can move forward uh, what we are doing now and make sure that we are updating the data that we are using and for us to also tap into the resource that that the PICRIS is stored in place because that's data we'll use to inform the product development that we are going to use. But like what I said, if we uh, look back 10 years ago, the landscape of available tools and models has changed significantly. You know, and, and now we, you know, most of the developer and the data collections in 30 years, 20 years ago, it was more concentrated on the US and Europe 
and the Caribbean regions. But now it's becoming more attentive and it's becoming more fashionable here in the Pacific region. And I think we should look into this seriously. And that's what we are working towards. So really, for, from the company perspective, we are encouraging, we are hoping that we are going to work clo uh, closely and cooperatively with, uh, with this project to make sure that the data that are used will be available to, to us to inform the uh, product development that we are currently using right now. And we are happy to hear that this work is going forward in terms of uh, modernizing the system and also collecting the latest data for us. Because we have received some sort of a complaint with the model that we are using right now from the region. And then we found out that the data that we are using has been uh, 10 years old. So that's more like an outdate, given the climate change the impact of us expectating the, the whole uh, situations now with the weather event. So we are moving forward and hopefully the data that will uh, update for Icarus will also help us in terms of our policy formulations. Thank you, Simon, and hope that uh, gives some, uh, some clear answer from my side and uh, looking forward to answering any questions. Thank you, um, Lotto, for your intervention. Um, definitely, um, the, the need to update the data is there, and um, we, we hope to progress that much further um, from the SBC side. So moving on in terms of um, with the program, we have explored what works or you know, what is best practice, what are challenges at the global and regional level, and we've heard about some of these lessons that can obviously also be opportunities. So if we can now take a look at the risk data and information at the national level, um, with that, I'd like to invite our country panelists um, to provide some insight. And let me first invite Sane Lolo from the Ministry of Finance, from the Tonga Ministry of Finance. Sane is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer for the Resilient Development and Financing Division of Tonga's Ministry of Finance. And has provided advice on mainstreaming risks and resilience into the government processes, systems, and plans. Sane oversees the implementation of the recently approved disaster risk financing strategy for Tonga in support of the ministry's contribution to a more resilient, inclusive, and sustainable Tonga. She has worked with the Ministry of Finance for over 10 years, serving under the Economic and Social Policy and Projects and Aid Management Division. Prior to leading the Resilient Development and Financing Division as Deputy CEO, she worked as the Chief Economist under the Project and Aid Management Division, which is responsible for managing development assistance from multilateral and bilateral development partners. She continues to manage multilateral donor-funded programs to this day, particularly on climate change and disaster risk reduction projects. Thank you, Sane, for um, taking the time to join the panel this um, today. Tonga has been part of the initial PICRAFI initiative and saw that which saw the rollout and deployment of the Pacific Risk Information System. Tonga has also been beneficiary to the disaster risk financing option offered through um, PICRIC uh, insurance products under the PICRAFI program. From a policy or capacity perspective, um, and already hearing what the other panelists have mentioned, what are some examples that Tonga has put in place to address collecting and using data for risk information that can inform decision making? And maybe if we have time, what are some of the gaps that you think um, may need to be enhanced further? Thank you, Sane, and over to you. Sorry, you're on mute, Sane. Thank you, Aileen, and I'm very grateful for the invitation extended uh, from SBC to participate in this session and to share the development of the financial protections, which help shed light on the disaster risk financing instrument policy priorities for Tonga uh, to guide us on where to focus. If I may start with the rationale behind establishing the resilient division in 2020, uh, the ministry considered the importance of strengthening its leadership capacity in supporting the national resilient agenda, including enhancing Tonga's ability to access directly to and effectively manage uh, of disaster risk uh, financing. Um, we have managed in such a short period of time with the assistance of the World Bank and its PICRA fee program to develop the disaster risk financing strategy 
aiming at reducing uh, Tonga's economic and physical effect of disasters by combining instruments that address various identified risks. And data is key to the implementations of the strategy. Our existing data is based on the current information that have already collected and that could be updated should more recent data becomes available on hazard and vulnerability. However, we still lack to capture similar data from the private sector. Uh, this is an ongoing challenge for us and perhaps the same in other countries due to the volume and complexity of data, as well as the supporting technology and infrastructure. Maintaining and sustaining of this infrastructure is very much needed. At the same time, the human, resor the human um, resource capacity, such as the skill and knowledge is also critical to ensure that the quality and the control measures for data collections are not subject to regular and unbiased reviews. Capacity building is also needed, not only for the public, but also for the private sector. Uh, data collection should also be an ongoing exercise and not just a one-off event. Uh, as mentioned before by the speakers before me, data ownership is also very important. And um, you may also aware that Tonga had received a number of payouts from the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Insurance Company. The affordability and sustainability of the insurance premium remains a challenge. We believe that collection and updating the risk data would help to determine the product development and in consolidating risk pooling so as to help decision making processes more effective and possibly to bring down the premium cost. Um, we welcome the work SPC is doing under the paper fee to update the exposure data, given the climate change expected the frequency and severity of extreme weather event. And um, Tonga is willing to assist with this work to ensure that the decision, the decision is going to make by our leaders is based on factual and updated information. Again, ongoing collaboration is very much needed with uh, from the regional and international institutions, such as the SBC and PICRIC, who both have the technical capabilities to support us in this area. I'll stop um, from there, Aileen, thank you. Thank you um, very much, Sane, for, for your intervention. Um, so with that, we will move to uh, Cook Islands. Um, from Tonga, we'll move across to Cook Islands. And um, I'd like to invite um, Garth Henderson, who's the uh, secretary, the financial secretary for the Ministry of Finance for Cook Islands. Um, Garth currently holds the position, this position, and is the head of the Ministry of Finance and Economic Management in Cook Islands. He, the secretary, is a principal financial and economic advisor to government, and he has more than 30 years of experience as a public servant, the majority of which was spent at um, the Ministry of Finance and Economic Management and the police department. He has also spent three years with the Asian Development Bank Board as a director's advisor and was personally involved in the establishment of the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Insurance Company, PICRIP, hosted in the Cook Islands. He has also been serving as the interim member of um, the PICRIP Council and Garth is also the chairperson of the technical working group of the Pacific Resilience Fund that has been under development as mandated by the PIPs leaders. So if I could. Um, move over and ask you your question, which is similar to that that has been asked of Tonga. From your perspective, from a policy or capacity perspective, what are some of the examples that Cook Islands is, um, is already doing to address data for risk information? And as well as that, um, what are some gaps that you think need to be addressed um, in the Cook Islands? Thank you so yeah. much, Jonathan, yeah. over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I think uh, the Cook Islands is a very small, uh, very small country with a very small government, very small public service, and that places these sort of uh, um, uh, constraints upon uh, an SID. Uh, and with certainly without a regional program of support, uh, we probably wouldn't have uh, done much in terms of disaster risk uh, reduction or resilience by ourselves. So the uh, the regional support uh, through the nature of programs like this is very welcome. Uh, the biggest threat from a historic perspective to the Cook Islands has been tropical cyclones. 
uh, we're very familiar with it. And, and this mere fact has uh, sort of determined the landscape for data collection, uh, you know, to support decision making. The biggest threat is tropical cyclones. But what we are seeing is sort of climate change related emerging threats. We're seeing uh, intense uh, rainfall. We're starting to see droughts. So that's, uh, we're seeing COVID. So those are other things that are uh, sort of new emerging that we need to deal with. If we look at what we've been done doing uh, in the past uh, at the national level, again, primarily devoted to tropical cyclones. I think the first survey was uh, 2010 uh, after Cyclone Pet uh, devastated one of our outer island communities. So uh, the focus there was uh, the building surveys. We started the first building survey. The next phase of, uh, that was in uh, Aitutaki, we looked at uh, Rarotonga as well, and then we had to expand it across the, the 13 populated islands, so a lot of work there. The second phase was not only building surveys, but looking at vulnerable populations, looking at water sanitation and a range of other things. So you would see uh, emergency management Cook Islands having to work with st statistics office. and. Uh, I think the most recent work uh, we're looking at is uh, reviewing those surveys. But uh, the other interesting one came about last year with the COVID-19, where we had to get out there quite rapidly and start looking at the vulnerable populations, the sort of what they call the comorbidities, you know, the, the people, the older people, where were the older people, where were the obese people, so that we could make some decisions around our medical response to COVID. So that was very timely. I think we have, uh, we had a pretty good uh, mechanism to get out there, have those conversations. In terms of um, uh, what are the gaps, you know, what are some of the, uh, what are the challenges we face moving forward? And I've heard this, uh, I heard this in several other pr presentations earlier, which I'll highlight. But first up was, uh, I'll just talk about rainfall. These intense and unanticipated rainfall events are costing millions of dollars, uh, damaging roads and uh, bridges and drains. So we've already had to put uh, millions of dollars of investment, redesigning roads, uh, increasing the size of drains. Uh, drought situation, we've got, uh, we seem to, based on the weather patterns, uh, particularly in the isolated outer islands, it's uh, looking at how much water storage is spending money on uh, putting more water storage out there. So again, this, the importance of data to inform decision making, which involves millions of dollars becomes critically important. The other sort of aspect that's popped up before is institutional arrangements, the efficiencies of the institutional arrangements we have. We've got um, different sources of data across government and uh, a handful of technicians uh, who, who tend to be old and very territorial. So our ability to consolidate information management across uh, government and put it in one place, common hardware under sound information management protocol, we've tried it before without much success. Uh, it's something that we're going to revisit uh, shortly, simply from a public service efficiency uh, perspective. Um, Absorptive capacity, I think Tonga spoke about it. It's our ability to do more surveys, not only from a um, from a sort of institutional uh, point, you know, uh, number of technicians, but also from a community uh, perspective. The community is tired of us surveying. So you've got to pace or space out surveys. Otherwise they start saying, well, uh, you, you spoke to me three months ago on something different. Why are you knocking on my door again? So there's this uh, pacing, uh, pacing of uh, surveys, but again, absorptive capacity, how much more, uh, you know, data collection surveys can we take out? You know, how, how much data can we take in, can we manage and make accessible? Which comes to the point that Lotu made about the uh, accessibility of data, information, public, you know, as a public good and the robustness. I think there's a lot of work uh, we need to do in that space. Uh, a lot of the challenges have been um, uh, people problems where you've got a handful of uh, technicians who hold the skill sets and uh, we're just not putting enough uh, uh, investment into bringing new people into like the stats and into GIS. 
so that's something we've got to uh, work on ourselves. And uh, if there is a assistance out there, we'll certainly appreciate it. Uh, two weeks ago, I signed a later contract uh, with about 1.7 million, and it was funded by New Zealand. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not too aware of the details, but I get a sense that uh, LIDAR is going to provide a, a new dimension to uh, data collection, uh, development planning across a whole range of things. And uh, I think that's going to add value to the work we're doing in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Garth. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. I think last time we met in person was in Germany when we founded uh, uh, PQuick. So it's, it's great to see you at least on, on video. Thanks a lot for, for these inputs and thanks to, to, to all speakers for their really interesting insights. I think we have a couple of, of things that, that have been emerging, uh, let's say, throughout, throughout this, this, um, this session. Uh, obviously, one relating to sustainability. You know, I found it very interesting um, what you were just saying on you know, how to make the public sector more efficient, how you access private uh, uh, sector data sets uh, how do you, uh, you know, how do you use uh, the latest technologies to inform decision making? So this is all very, very interesting, and um, I, um, and and we would like to ask you a couple of more questions. For example, Aviva on and and Carlos, you were both speaking uh, about, you know, that it's right now it's it's make it's it's easier for countries to be able to use risk data and turn it to usable information. Um, and that there are a lot of decision support tools out there that are de deployed, and you know some country people have had training on these, how to use these, but obviously these tools need to be sustained, and and um, and, and and technical support needs to be there on a long term basis to continuously update the tools and to 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 you know actually use them then for for informed decision makings. So what what according to you, and I would start with Habiba. Are some of the factors that you would need to consider upfront when you design projects to ensure that tools and are used uh, sustainably and that they actually bring benefits long term. Uh, we would start with Habiba and then go over to Carlos. Um, thanks, Simon. So it's a challenging question you're asking, and so from. World Bank side, obviously, we have access to more data and we are on a uh, faster bandwidth. We also have access to more uh, software and hardware. From the country perspective, looking at how, say, for example, asset database and risk based planning is done, I would say have a conversation with the central agencies like Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Planning who really use this information. Check where they are putting in their GIS systems. Um, so, because a lot of the PACRIS information is georeferenced, so it needs a GI ex expertise in there. See what kind of software they're using, because we're encouraging them to use open source software where possible. And we also encourage them to use and make the data available within the country. They don't have to make it globally available, but definitely open it up within the government agencies. Um, so if you know what they have, then really bring in the PACRIS as another layer within that and link it to the asset register. So we are working with a number of countries in the Pacific. We're encouraging them to do uh, a re asset register at least for public infrastructure. So public buildings, which tend to get damaged a great deal after a disaster, but also some public housing and things like that. So really make that as part of the decision making. Once you do that, I think the sustainability and the maintenance will come in itself. At the moment, the challenge is that PACRIS and the PICRAPI data is external, it's not easily accessible, and it's not part of the normal tool making. So I hope I've answered it from, I think, from the bank team side, it's a bit easier. From our counterparts and the countries, is a bit more challenging, and I think we just need to do some more um, data gathering. Thank you. And great to see so many people I know. So it's good to see you virtually. Carlos, over to you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Simon. Yeah, so I'll just uh, 
add on to what uh, Habiba was saying, and I think I won't repeat what she's saying, but what she's saying is actually uh, um, quite correct in that sense. But what, what I can add to that is, uh, I think you mentioned, one of the speakers mentioned the LIDAR surveys um, um, that Tuvalu and Samoa uh, now have. Uh, what I noticed when I, I was doing Tuvalu and the LIDAR survey came out and we, we obtained data on, on that. Um, and what I noticed is that it's technology actually plays, plays a big part. Because the lighter save was able to 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 give us information on, on tides, on land contours, um, on geospacing around the maritime zones. So it was a lot of information captured in one data set. Uh, so in that sense, before, if like for example, if you wanted to do some some planning on a, on a land based project, you would have to go to the lands department to get the uh, the land survey uh, information. You have to go to the med office to get the uh, climatic uh, data sets. You have to go somewhere else for, for other information. But the LIDAR survey was actually able to, to consolidate a lot of this uh, uh, GIS spatial type information into one, and that made it really easy for planning. Um, and that's now become actually a, 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 quite a sought after tool and a sought after data set. So from that perspective, uh, I think technology plays a, plays a big part. And also the, the, we keep repeating ourselves around the accessibility and, and maintenance of the data. Sustainability of projects also relies on um, uh, Having continuity of data, and one of the things that uh, uh, I quite like what Lotto was saying is that the um, that risk is dynamic, and so the data needs to be dynamic as well. So we need to be updating, constantly updating the data, and be able to fit that information into into uh, project designs. Um, instead of relying, if you rely on old data, then obviously uh, you're behind the eight ball, to, so to speak, before you even start your project. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, um, Carlos, for that um, intervention. So maybe as a next um, question, um, and I would like to um, direct this to Rashmin. Um, you mentioned in the application of um, data sets, um, something to do with adaptive social protection. Would it be possible for you to expand on that a bit as an example of how data sets such as that in PACRIS can be used? That, that, thanks, Eileen. Yes, happy to expand on that. Uh, a lot of the time, the, the risk modeling environment we've been talking about focuses a lot on the structure typologies, right? About the buildings, the types of roof, the, 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 the wall type, et cetera. However, there is also necessary information that we can collect regarding the social vulnerability. What type of households are they? What type of retrofit mechanisms are actually needed? So if you can actually integrate that, that becomes a much more rich, richer data set that directly applies to what kind of social protection strategies are can actually be implemented. How do we get the resources from ministries of finance at the, to the community level who are actually mo most vulnerable, not just structurally vulnerable, but socially vulnerable as well? A and that provides a very different risk profile and prioritize not only the types of interventions, but the communities that actually needed to be targeted as well. So that's where, for example, with the work of World Food Program, et cetera, uh, th that um, for example, in the Caribbean, we actually are working on in integrating those di two different dimensions. Hope that actually uh, answers the question. Thank you for, for that, Rashmin. Um, maybe if uh, there are, we can check if, if there are any other questions um, that um, participants um, have. Would there be any questions from the participants that are on this, this webinar? If not, then maybe uh, Simon, we could move maybe to the wrap up session. Um, and in terms of uh, the wrap-up session, I think we were just going to go around the room and um, 
maybe have one or two last comments from each of the panelists um, on what you think is an immediate opportunity for PACRIS. I know we've probably mentioned uh, a lot of it um, at the moment. Um, so if we could maybe start with yourself, Rashmin, go back to you again. What do you think are the one or two practical things that should be done um, with regards to improving maybe one, the accessibility? So looking at the challenges that came out in the conversations, um, just one or two practical things um, that are immediate opportunities uh, in terms of improving uh, data sets with regards to risk and risk information? Sure. Thank you, Hani. <clears throat> on, on a technical perspective, uh, uh, I would highlight uh, standards and interoperability, right? So one of the key challenges that we normally see when you have quite a few different countries um, and, and uh, different data standards as well, they will be using different information to communicate the same different same parts to another country. What I mean by that is how the data is actually recorded. The metadata, for example, could be actually quite different. And it is vital that there is a uniform data standard. So you could actually check like for like, right? So that is, for, for me, a, a, a practical example, which is actually very important that needs to be uh, considered. The second part is actually more from the operational perspective. I really do believe, and I think this is actually being done already, that there needs to be some ownership. And if you can actually make that link, for example, where ministries of finance takes that ownership, then it actually, makes it so much easier uh, because um, uh, at least in the Caribbean, ministries of finance actually have a lot more clout, right? And this actually facilitates, for example, sharing of data, et cetera. So that's one part from, um, uh, from an from a operations perspective, but another part in terms of a technical uh, perspective as well. much Rashmin that's that's very that's uh, I think that's that's a great answer and um, um, thank you so much we have a question um, and I would uh, in the in the chat box and I would actually like uh, to add, to pose it to RV if he's uh, still there and if the rains aren't too hard so um, there's a question on how important is re regular risk auditing to assess the efficacy and reliability of such databases uh, I would expect you have probably a couple of things to say on this. So, um, Avi, the floor is yours. Uh, th thank you, Simon. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, it's in the chat box and it says, um, how important is regular risk auditing uh, or auditing, I guess, to is, is assess, you know, the re reliability and, 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 uh, of, of such databases? Yeah, th th thank you. Th thank you very much for, for, for that question. Um, I mean, I, I, as I'm sure we we all know, this is absolutely critical, and, and this is all part of the, you know, of of the ongoing ongoing risk related monitoring um, that that needs to occur. Uh, we know climate, we know uh, population, society are, are evolving, and, and all this needs to be taken into account to always. Update our, our risk profile. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, it's absolutely critical. Yeah, maybe you can share just one one particular lesson from from the Pacific that might be particular on the Pacific, given um, I don't know the, the size of, of the countries or the, you know the, the specific challenges there are relating to the update of such uh, databases. Every yeah, th 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 thank you, Simon. Well. Um, what is extremely challenging here is we have a regional database, uh, which which means um, updating that updating the database is uh, you know is extremely challenging to do on on a regional scale. Uh, while there are many uh, projects 
that can support uh, the update, uh, local, some localized update of the database, having the, the financial support and resources to uh, holistically update uh, such a large database is, is obviously extremely challenging. And, and, and this is, um, you know, something we're trying to do under, under Geography. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hervé. So maybe, um, Simon, just to add on uh, to, to that and also to the, pan the participant who asked that question. So in terms of databases, um, one thing that we found in an online survey was that um, some of the uh, initiatives that were started some time ago are no longer, um, are no longer um, you know, working. And I think much of that is to do again with what has been mentioned by many of the panelists in terms of the capacity. I think the other issue is that many many of the countries are at different stages with regards to their ICT policies, which includes the the infrastructure in country for um, ICT. And so, um, in terms of take for instance Cook Islands, I know you are. Um, have you know cloud capacity whereas some of the other countries are still dealing with with servers and there's also other issues to do with that so in terms of making sure that databases in countries work is is something that each country faces um different different challenges with and and so yes it is important um to conduct regular risk auditing um, to assess the efficacy and reliability of such databases, which also is important towards what some other panelists have mentioned with regards to the credibility of the data um, in the databases. So thank you, thank you again for that question. So maybe um, I note that we only have three minutes left for this session. So just as a wrap up, I'd like to quickly go to um, Sane and uh, Garth, if maybe we could get one or two comments from you in terms of a wrap up of what you think is um, an immediate opportunity going forward for the region and also specifically at the national um, level uh, to enhance um, risk data and um, risk information for decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Elin. You go ahead, Saini. Uh, thank you, Eileen. Uh, if I would say that data sharing is uh, important at this stage and also um, capacity building of our official and, and relevant stakeholders um, so that decision making is uh, basically um, more than uh, effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Sane. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, look, uh, I want to focus on public service efficiency. I think uh, at the national level, we need to look at the different agencies collecting data. We need to see consolidation. We need to manage data better. We may need to make it more accessible with regular updates. Uh, we can create uh, richer data sets for working together. We need to create a great appreciation of data and information-based decision, decision making, and we need to give it the right budget support so we can uh, make it sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Garth. Um, Simon, should I just hand over to you for the close? Thank you. So just um, just from, from our side, from Arlene's and my side, uh, we would just really like to thank um, the organizers of the Understanding Risk um, Conference for the opportunity to, to host this event today. Uh, we're very grateful for, for the inputs and availability and the, the rich discussions we've had from, from all the participants. And uh, with this being said, um, I would just like to close the session and wish everybody a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Simon and uh, Aileen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now. Yeah. Yeah.